Hello, viewers, and uh, welcome again to this special live town hall meeting. Uh, whether you're in Richmond Hill in a live audience, or you're in Guyana, or anywhere around the world, or you're viewing this uh, from Facebook or YouTube, welcome. Uh, this special town hall meeting every week uh, is organized, presented, and powered by Globespan 24-7, where we discuss the issues that affect Guyana and Guyanese, and uh, we look at exploring opportunities for a better Guyana. We take this opportunity also to congratulate Nohar Singh on the 25th anniversary, anniversary of Travel Span, parent company of Globe Span 24-7. His contribution to Guyana, Guyana tourism, and the Guyana aviation uh, uh, sector has been immeasurable. And uh, we look forward for more from, to, from him uh, in the near future. This is the month of Ramadan, and I must, I must uh, reach out to my Muslim brothers and sisters around the world and in Guyana and in Trinidad and wish them a rewarding month of fasting. This is a town hall meeting, so your questions are paramount. Uh, if you are live in Richmond Hill or you on Facebook, uh, we, w we would certainly like to hear from you. Uh, if you're live in, in Richmond Hill, please raise your hands if you have a question. Uh, someone will get to you. Please be as brief as possible. You have about 30 seconds to ask your question. For those online, of course, you can um, uh, add your questions or comments, and we will get to as many of them as possible. Please, and more importantly, please share and like uh, this page uh, so that you can be notified or your friends and families around the world and in Guyana can see this very meaningful, engaging discussion on, uh, on, on topics that we choose. Uh, for those who would like to call in, I think the number will be posted. So be on the lookout for those numbers and you can call in. I know we are expecting a few special call-in guests and we will get to them as they call in. My name is Salim Nasruddin and I'm your moderator for today's discussion. Our guests today are um, Dr. Bishnu Ragunath, a Trinidadian senior lecturer and head of the Department of Political Science at the University of West Indies and the, Uni and the University of West Indies representative to the executive board of the Caribbean Association of Local Government Authorities. And I, and I believe he has a, a few more uh, bullet points he can uh, express during his presentations today. And we have also Mr. Nicholas Boyer, a Guyanese business executive and the president of the Guyana Chamber of Commerce. And, and of course, um, uh, Dr. Mr. Sesnarain Singh. Um, he is a Guyanese chartered accountant, a financial analyst, a strategist, and a columnist on financial issues. Sais lives in the United States. Our plan today is to talk a bit about, uh, confl about conflict of interest, uh, as it has been appearing quite a uh, few times over the last few months um, in Guyana. And, uh, but before we, we get into the conflict of interest, um, over the past three or four days, most of Guyanese in Guyana and outside of Guyana, and I'm quite sure many Caribbean nationals, uh, were glued to their Facebook or YouTube uh, videos um, getting uh, an insight into the discussion of the no-confidence motion uh, at the CCJ in Trinidad. So I wanted to spend a few uh, minutes um, talking about that, um, about that, the submissions that were made uh, at the CCJ with my guests today. So, uh, so with that, I wanted to uh, maybe bring in uh, our, our good doctor, uh, from Trinidad, and asks him and ask him, uh, what are your thoughts um, on the submissions by the government and the opposition? Uh, did did you did you did you had a look at the um, at the at the submissions and um, what are your thoughts? Well, thank you very much for having me on your program. Uh, yes, I did have a look at some of the submissions as well as the the issues that were presented before the courts. And what we could say, what the, the CCJ per se, and what, what I can say is simply that while we cannot say what will the result and the verdict be in this matter, the judges did in fact ask some very telling questions. 
to the uh, representatives of both the government and the opposition as they made their presentations to the court. Uh, for instance, they, they kept on asking the question, um, why, for instance, that the, the courts in Guyana took so long knowing full well that there was a 90-day limit um, beyond the uh, motion of no confidence that the elections was to be held should it, um, should, or should the government should have resigned. And, near, and the fact that the, the, the appeal court in Guyana went beyond the three-month period to give their ruling, thus pushing the, the whole issue back, there was the, also the concern being raised as to whether or not um, if a verdict does in fact go in the favor of the opposition against the government, how soon an election can be held in Guyana. Um, the government still insists that the Elections and Boundaries Commission or the Elections Commission has given them a minimum, an earliest date as November, but the whole question begs is simply, are the, is, I mean, how are they going to maintain the constitutional guidelines which said that an election should be held within three months? Um, so those were some of the critical concerns. It, it is still, I mean, we are now awaiting the verdict from the, the, the CCJ, but the point about it is simply, I think that uh, if we are to follow the questions, I think there were serious concerns that the CCJ would have had in how the government of Guyana acted, and not only the government of Guyana, but the institutions within Guyana, I'm talking about both the, EBC, the Elections Commission, as well as the, the, the Court and the Court of Appeal, um, in how they would have operated in this matter. Uh, were you surprised at some of the questions that the um, senior judges had for the attorneys? Definitely not, because, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we all sat here, we knew uh, what was happening. It was simply a matter now of simply saying, how would this thing go forward? How, how can we go forward and, and what were the, were the steps that we need to take? And it is in this context that uh, we were not surprised at all of some of the questions um, and how it has been pl played out in the courts. Uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, you of course um, live in Guyana and operate in Guyana. What were some of your takeaway if you if you had a chance to look at uh, the uh, submissions? So I was able to, to look at some of the submissions and I, I caught a lot of the rest of it from the, the media. And I can tell you one thing, I mean, as a young person in Guyana and trust into a leadership role, uh, some of what I saw um, about party paramountcy kind of scared me because you got to remember in my generation we're very individual thinkers so when you see lawyers making representations that you know what when you sit down there in parliament you are to vote along party lines you know no matter what they, they you know so if, if the party suddenly puts up a law to start killing children we must all just vote along party lines I mean that does not make any sense to me I mean, it's not in the spirit of democracy. So I, 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 when, I, when I looked at those arguments uh, that were being made, I was very shocked. That, what, you know, what, it what, were, you, were you as a young guy and he's aware that parliamentarians uh, should be voting um, along, uh, along the party list? I don't. I mean, so. Or do you I, agree with it? Or do you agree with it? But the way I would say it is that, I mean, you're going to have a lot of people trying to say that you should and you shouldn't. I mean, whether it's a vote of, of conscience or, or not. But the key thing is, I don't think I would agree with what what um, Neil Boston put forward in his his submissions. There's no way, you. Know, I mean, if you look at the name of the law, it's called the Representation of People Act. At what point do we realize that the government? is for the people. The government is not for the party, right? The party is a collection of people who are, you know, who have chosen to, to, to kind of go along common grounds on a political path. But the government is for the people. So party paramountcy should have died somewhere along with, the, with, with, with communism in, in the, the Soviet Socialist Republic. So I don't know why I'm saying party paramountcy today. Yeah, I had the same feeling too that um, I was I was looking at a description of what dictatorship is basically, you know, and there was like a justification for it. But I want to switch to um, says, um, uh What's your takeaway on the last three days of um, deliberations in Trinidad? 
I've never spent so such a long time in court like I did over the last three days. So um, uh, I looked every minute of it. It was it was fascinating, um, hilarious sometimes, but fascinating. But for me, I was really impressed with the depth of questions that came out from the judges. Uh, I focused my mind on them because I knew where the the argument was going to come from from both sides, um, and I wasn't surprised. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the advocates. I'm more going to focus on what I s observed from the judges. The depth of the questions, I thought they had an attitude of mind that brought an intrusiveness to law. Um, and, and I kind of believe this is what is happening in a lot of their minds. How do we walk Guyana back into a position where we can reconstruct constitutional rule. And that is the big challenge, I think, that they will be faced with right now. Because any rational mind will know there's a foregone conclusion. And I'm not going to talk about the conclusion because uh, that will come out when the judges issue their decision. But whatever is the conclusion, Guyana still has to walk back towards constitutional rule because we are outside of constitutional rule right now. You check the constitution, there's nothing that provides for a Guyana after May 21st, March 21st to now. And that that is the interesting part of the judgment that I'm going to be looking for. Well, uh, were you surprised at some of their questioning on the Guyana court, uh, uh, the appellate court versus um, what what is being brought to them at the CCJ? It is, it is not my place to second judge the, the courts in Guyana, but um, I could feel a sense of why is this here in front of us? Um, you know, why is this really here in front of us? But um, again, let's wait on the judgment because it's going to be, this is a judgment that will decide not just for Guyana, but the entire Caribbean region that followed because it's going to set a precedence, a jurisprudence precedence for everyone. Across the Caribbean, people will follow this for generations to come, whatever is this judgment. So this is fantastic. This is fantastic times for me as far That's as... Good, good. So, so Dr. Vishnu, uh, uh, Guyana, of course, was on center stage. Uh, the lights were on us and the raw side of us uh, probably came out in, in those uh, deliberations. Um, uh, you are Trinidadian. Um, what, how does this impact Guyana's image how does this position us in the caribbean as as as, as a uh, as a republic well for all intents and purposes there was a feeling um long time ago i mean ever since the the matter was uh went to the the, the high court in in guyana why is this matter going to the high court because as far as they were concerned as far as most of us were concerned within the context of all our laws in the in the caribbean once you face a vote of no confidence and you have lost that vote of no confidence it is anticipated that the, the government will hand over uh, or call elections within three months um so it is something that that for instance most of us as political scientists and lay people in the caribbean would have said but why is guyana going down this route um why are they not going to go and call the elections when they should and why is the government now challenging this thing when initially they accepted it uh, so there's that, there's, there was that flavor um, as to whether or not there's too much politics getting into, into this whole issue. But again, this is politics. Uh, and beyond that now, I think the, the eyes of the Caribbean and the, looking at, at Guyana and believing to some extent that the Guyana government, uh, if they felt so confident of themselves, they should have gone back to the polls and let the people give them another mandate to take the government forward and take the country forward for the next five years. But the point about it is that they, there's that concern that maybe they're not as confident as they should be. And uh, in the context of all the, the oil and everything else, gas and everything else that mm -hmm. is coming on stream, um, is it simply a matter of trying to do enough to ensure that when they actually do go to the polls, they could be assured of a victory? Uh, so it, the, the, the whole question here is simply one which says, how is the, how is the Caribbean and, and Trinidad looking at this thing? 
um, in Guyana, we are looking at it as to, to see where exactly uh, the Guyana government is willing to go, how far they are willing to go in the context of ensuring that constitutional rule is followed and adhered to. And in beyond that, however, we will then have to wait and see how does the elections commission in Guyana treat with whatever is going to happen beyond that. Good. Uh, and Nicholas, um, um, how did this last three days help or, or harmed Guyana's image and position in the Caribbean from your perspective? Well, I mean, I, I think what it has done is put us in the spotlight for almost a, a comical case. I mean, the, the, going back to the fact that matter is it, what, what, the, uh, what the good doctor just said is that you know, clearly everybody with common sense understands what we felt should have happened. And, clear, and, and it seems to be that you have a government running from an election process. So what they're doing, I don't know who's advising them or who their strategists are, but they're spending political capital at, you know, almost minute by minute because it would have been a stronger move to go back to the polls. But everybody, I'm sure, who is able to analyze it you know, thoroughly, they don't, they're not going to kind of associate the government with the whole country because on the, on the other side, you have the opposition making their arguments. So you, I don't think it has harmed our, our image. But um, clearly, you, you, the thing is, is that it looks like things are being stymied, you know? So what I would say is that let's not talk about the image being harmed. What we could talk about, and this is something that the chamber had gone out and said, is that all of this, you know, back and forth and fighting without kind of coming to a firm, settled position where you have a government in place that is legitimate and is there, you know, not one that is, well, is may be legitimate or may not be legitimate, depending on how this case goes, has affected business. The chamber had done a survey and had shown, you know, almost two thirds of businesses are feeling some effect since this no confidence motion case has been brought. So you clearly have that impacting the business climate. So that's the thing that's most that's being affected the most by this case. And we want to come to some sort of finality because I'll give the example I usually use is that if you are a small contractor and you're doing work for government and then you have the opposition saying, okay, well, if we come into power, it's not necessary that we will honor payments for that. So, you know, you, you, you kind of now sit back and say, okay, I'm now exposed on a credit you know, in terms of credit to the government because I've done work. I haven't been paid for it yet. You know, do I continue to, to exactly. expose yeah. myself? So it has real consequences. And if you're an international investor, are you going to say, okay, well, you know, I've made a treaty with, with this government that's currently in place, but if you have a switch, is that treaty going to be recognized or are they going to change the terms of, uh, of an agreement? So I'm not saying that this is the end of the world, but it, what, it happen, what is happening is that we have an unnecessary um, kind of speed bump in the business community. Gotcha. And to say, so you share some of um, um, Nicholas's uh, contention that it has specific, more importantly, a, 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 an internal economic down uh, harm in it. Well, I, I mean, in international business, what has generally been uh, the new model is that in addition to the real dollars and cents, uh, reputational damage uh, has a big intangible impact. Um, and this is where the reputational damage, uh, I believe, can can hurt us most because we've been here before. Guyana was in a, a state once whereby our democracy was threatened um, and, and we survived and we, we recovered. So I'm, as I, I want to agree with Nick um, that... Um, we can recover from this. So it's not like the end of the world. But clearly, within the Caribbean family, which is closely wedded, CARICOM, if you look at CARICOM, across CARICOM, all those islands have a strong reputation of embracing democracy. So th this looks like Guyana doesn't want to be part of this family that follows the principle of democracy. Um, so it does hurt our reputation. And I was shocked when... Uh, Senior Counsel uh, Neil Boston said, and I was like, wow, 
And he said, I quote, and it was said in today's Chronicle, the Guyana Constitution was amended to prohibit members of parliament from voting against their list. So what immediately what hit me was that, is there six to five rubber stamps in the Guyana parliament? If that's the case, we only need two MPs, one for the government and one for the opposition, and they could rubber stamp each other every, whole day and night. And that's the challenge. Um, and that is not the design of our constitution, to have 65 MPs slavishly following the whips. They should be able to question their whips. Of course, you know, you, you have to, you know, have a, a group, a consensus position. But MPs have a right to say, you know, I don't like what happened at Daisuku. And I think that is the point that Mr. Charandas Pasad brought out as his reason for breaking ranks. He didn't like what happened in the sugar industry, nothing else. And, 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 and so hence we wasted over $70 million pursuing a reversal of, of, of the, the, the Chief Justice decision. And, and we, we, are no, we haven't advanced since January. Honestly, they, they, uh, uh, based on everything I'm hearing from business leaders, Guyana is on a, on a pause. Yeah, and, and, and picking, back, uh, picking up on what you mentioned, uh, much of the debate was an exposure of our constitution and, and it's, maybe its limitations and maybe its uh, inability to, to cater for all circumstances um, as questioned by the judges and as debated by the, uh, by the attorneys. D did you see the discussion um, um, bordering on, on constitutional, require, the, the, the requirements for constitutional changes? Well, I'm on record, I'm on record, and I'm gonna re repeat what I said. I'm on record to state that Guyana definitely needs constitutional reform. This is not a matter for the PPP or PNC anymore. You talk to any youth in Guyana, any man, any woman in Guyana, they're all saying the time for constitutional reform is upon us again. And we got to fix it because this constitution does not work. This is a constitution that is designed for winner takes all. So you win 51% and hence you control 100%. That is ridiculous. There should be room and space for other parties, other groupings. And let me bring to the table the fact that Guyana is now officially a land of minorities. Nobody, no race, no religion, no, no um, grouping constitute 51% anymore. So we need to start collaborating, working together, and building the nation. That's what we need to move towards, a constitution... And, and that facilitates and, that. And Dr. Bishtu, the same question to you. Uh, did you did you sense uh, an urgency in uh, looking at Guyana Constitution and revising some of these uh, articles? Definitely, there's need for the revision of some of the articles of your constitution. Uh, for all intents and purposes, I am an outsider. I can't tell the Guyanese people how to, to go about and change their constitution. But the point about it, I think it is necessary that constitutional reform becomes a critical issue. Now, I don't know how it's going to work in Guyana. I know in Trinidad, for instance, that we've been calling for constitutional reform here for the last 30 years. The unfortunate thing, because our parties are so closely aligned, well, not closely aligned, but rather closely um, separated from each other, that no party could ever win a constitutional majority to go and say they could go about on their own and change the constitution. Unfortunately, when a party is in, in opposition, it calls for constitutional reform. But once they get into government, they say, no, we like it just the way it is. And exactly. that's how they continue. Mm -hmm. So I am not sure what is going to happen in Guyana. But I do believe that there is need for constitutional reform in Guyana. The same way there is need for constitutional reform in Trinidad. question is, can it happen? And will it happen under our present administrations? And when I say administration or political directorates from both sides of the mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and based, on the deba uh, based on the debates that you heard over the last three days, uh, you might have gotten a glimpse of um, what area specifically in our constitution you believe as a, as a, as a, as a non guyanese uh, might be of interest for us to focus on. Well, clearly, some of the institutions that you need to focus on, some of the institutions Clearly, there's there's need to con be concerned with how that happens. 
uh, the composition of the parliament, I am not sure whether um, how it is actually going to, to, to change, if it at all, all it will change. But there is need to understand too that there is need to how we could deal with that. Um, there has been concern, for instance, in the part where, past where the PR has been working for Guyana as opposed to um, uh, first past the post and whether there should be some mixture. I mean, I know when I did the local government, review way back in 1995-96 in, in Guyana, uh, people were calling for first past the post to be mixed with PR because they said that PR did not necessarily give them the kind of representation that they need. So those are some of the things that I know as a fact coming to the fore in Guyana. What is going to come out from this case and where we go from here, again, this is something mm. that the Guyanese people will have to determine. And two specific questions I wanted to ask you, um, as was debated over the last two days, three days, was um, what is the majority in Trinidad and what lessons can Guyanese learn from that in terms of your, your votes in the parliament? And secondly, on the issue of dual citizenship. Uh, we've had um, um, former Prime Minister uh, Bastia Pande, um, who clearly says that um, a dual citizenship can operate in, at any level in Trinidad. Can you confirm that with us? And, uh, and Because those are the two contentious issues that were uh, being used as a way of um, uh, demoting the uh, no confidence vote. Well, the thing about it, we had discussed the dual citizenship under uh, Basse Pandey some years ago. And clearly, it, while it, I don't think we went to the courts with it, there's consensus within Trinidad that you cannot be uh, or you cannot have dual citizenship and be a member of parliament. And they have attempted to, to, to mitigate that. In fact, uh, within this current regime, uh, one of the members of, uh, one of the member ministers who was appointed by the prime minister as a senator um, was appointed, and it was only after he was appointed, he, it was recognized that he maintained dual citizenship to with another country. And he was forced to go and um, renege on that other the citizenship from that other country and then come back and be reappointed as a minister. So we have accepted long time that dual citizenship is not something that will that should go ahead. Now I hear the case in Guyana and I know that for instance in the last uh, well in the in, in the parliament before the, the 21st of December there were members on both sides of your uh, parliament who had dual citizenship. Some ministers right. also had dual citizenship. And as a result, they have now been forced to uh, withdraw from the, the parliament and as ministers. But the point about it, dual citizenship is one of those issues, I think, that we have settled on, that a, you must have singular citizenship for your respective countries in order that you sit in parliament. Gotcha. Great. Um, I think we have uh, a caller, um, uh, maybe a subject matter, uh, rather than a caller, uh, Mr. Charandas Prasad on the call. Devin, can you put Charandas Prasad on the call? Oh, on, on, online? Hello, Devin? Yes, one second. I know we Charandas are, Prasad was we are on, on the call. We are con uh, but since, contacting uh, while we're waiting on him, I, the part Hello. two of my question... Oh, I guess we have him on, on the call. Hi, yes. Hello. Uh, Mr. Charandas Prasad, how are you doing? This is Salem. I am good, thank you, my brother. I'm good, thanks. How are things? Good, good, good. I'm quite sure you were uh, glued to your YouTube or your Globespun 24-7. All day, yesterday, man. All day, all day. Uh, what, what are your thoughts so far on how the discussions went? Well, discussion, you mean the arguments in the court? Absolutely, yes. The arguments went one way only. It made the government lawyers look like they had something up there wherever the sun doesn't shine. Because everything that they presented was rebutted by the judges. Everything. Uh, w w was uh, and, and similar questions to what I asked my guests today, and I'm, I'll be asking you. And my guests, of course, you guys can chime in at any time and ask um, Charandas a question or two as you wish. Um, uh, were you expecting that level of um, questioning from the judges? To some extent, no. Particularly from the president, Justice Saunders. I had somehow 
a misconstrued view that because he had ruled in the uh, the first case that Nigel Hughes referred to, I thought that he might have um, held on to his own ruling. But they, they made it clear that you only divide by two if it's an even number. And Guyana's parliament has... An odd, odd number. An odd number. Uh, uh, what was um, life like for you over the last three days since you were your name might have been mentioned <laughs> a thousand times um, during those uh, discussions? And some call you hero, some call you um, zero. But um, yeah. um, what was life for you like? Um, tell us a bit about uh, you know the calls you might have gotten, um, some of the interactions you might have um, experienced. Well, I was advised by a very good friend to not go on Facebook in relation to the TCJ's hearing of this case, because it was our appeal. And so I only commented on something that a good friend and now colleague, well, I shouldn't say now colleague, he's a lawyer in England, Tom Caron, voice and opinion, and I said, you can't be that lopsided. And I did, in fact, address his position, because he made it clear that my vote was illegal. And I said, you need to first read the Constitution. They had 28 days after anyone takes a seat in Parliament if the seat is deemed illegal to object to it, failing which the seat has been ratified as taken properly. While it is still deemed an illegal occupation of a seat in Parliament or holding of a seat, the vote or anything that this person does after 28 days has to be ratified because it would have deemed to have been proper. Mm -hmm. So, but, but, but to answer the question more precisely, for the past a few days, I was concerned, very concerned, that the ruling may go against us. And after having listened to the arguments, the questions by the judges, and to some extent, not submission, but some of what the judges handed down, it is clear that this appeal will be granted. And so the government will be given time also to resign, um, sorry, to hold an election. Yes. GCOM uh, must be ready. Yes, and, um, and yes, uh, and, and, and I know we have Dr. Bishnu up until about uh, maybe 10 minutes more. Is that correct, Dr. Bishnu? Certainly, uh, 10 minutes yeah. more. Yeah, I, I would love for um, some of your questioning to um, our good friend, Charandas Prasad. <coughs> Fire away, if I can answer, I'll do my best. Basically, I, I, I understand Mr. Prasad's position quite clearly. And I, I, the fact that he made reference to the 28-day notion um, that there was that issue, I don't think there was any concern about that because once the government of Guyana, once the parliament... Um, approved them and did not challenge their, their seats right. in the parliament in that first 28 days, they sat there all legitimately. Right. And that, I think, is the main concern that we yeah. would have had. And it was not only Mr. Charandas. I think that's the most important thing. It is not only Mr. Charandas who held dual citizenship. It, there all were the several other, other members. Yeah. Yeah. So if Mr. Charandas is, is illegitimate, in that context, all the other members of parliament who held dual citizenship would have been deemed illegitimate also. And um, all the actions that they would have taken since 2015 had uh, to be reversed. The election. Exactly. So yes. it, that's in that context that I will not, in fact, disagree with Mr. Charandas that he was there legitimately. Uh, and Mr. Charandas, you, uh, yes. of course, it was contended that you. Um, were not aware, or you were aware that you could not sit in Parliament. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'll tell you this Did, did you know that you could not sit in Parliament because of your dual citizenship, or for whatever other reasons? I knew that people with dual citizenship could not hold a seat in Parliament. That was given. That's a constitutional article that we can't get away from. What I did, in fact, argue, and when I told Kamraj, I said, I have a Canadian passport. Kamrad said, Ross with you. A lot of people got Canadian passports. Look at Gail Tishira. And that's what he said. He didn't mention anybody else. But I knew that Dominic Gaskin was a born British subject. I also knew that 
Carl Grenig held a foreign passport. I, I was sure that Rupert held, but I didn't pay attention to that. So I knew that I was not alone. But what I, what I literally weighed against all of that was the fact that I went, I applied for and was granted remigrant status by the, uh, the office of the, not the office of the president, but the next to them there, opposite from the office of the president. They have this office that allows you to apply for and granted remigrant status by the State Department. I applied for and was granted. I took in a vehicle duty free. I established myself by way of a student at the University of Guyana, registered as a lawyer after I graduated from law school, filed my taxes, and I practiced as a lawyer in Guyana. I felt that I've established myself as a guy or re-established myself as a Guyanese. And so I did not see that I was doing anything wrong or illegal, as they had put it. Right, so you were, give, you were given uh, uh, Guyanese remigrant status which yes, allowed you to behave and status. act and perform as a Guyanese at whatever level. Um, That's right. And, and I think another big issue that came up during the discussion was all the, the whole issue of voting against uh, a, a list or your list, list or your party yes. list. Uh, and I wanted to get also Dr. Bishnu into this also. Maybe you can give me your, your, your response to it. Uh, do you know or, or, or are you aware that the Constitution does not allow you, Charandas Prasad, to vote against your APNU or AFC list? No, 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 no. It does not say that you can't vote against the list. It says that if you are to vote against your list, you must inform the speaker in writing. Now, what is illegal? If you want to deem it illegal, I did not inform the speaker. Why did I not inform the speaker that I was going to vote against the list? I was voting against a particular art, uh, act of parliamentarians. I was voting against a motion, but I did not. I did not plan on voting against the list. I listened to the debate. And when I listened to Amna Ali saying, we are 33 and you are 32, you're going to move a vote of no confidence, bring it on. They were not arguing. And if we all reflect back on what the speaker did when Joe Harmon was speaking. That man is such a dunce. The speaker told him, you cannot be personal. You cannot be labeling people on a personal basis. You are to speak on the motion of confidence. Mm -hmm. Tell this house why your government should be held to be confident because a motion of confidence has been tabled and is being argued against the government. And so Harmon was rebuked by the speaker for being personal when he said that Jagdeo is talking about no confidence motion and he was not married to the lady for five years. He fooled everybody and he went on on Jagdeo's marriage to Varshini, which was in fact not a legal marriage. It was a marriage nonetheless, celebrated in style by Hindu rites. But it was not a legal marriage. Mm -hmm. But he was rebuked right. for getting personal. Speak on the confidence motion, not on the man's personal life. Yeah. And so you sat there and you listened to the crap that came from the government side. They yeah. were defeated in that motion by argument, particularly by argument. And so when it came yes. to the vote, my mind was then made up. And yeah. further made up when they moved to stop the count. And all the abuse that I took then, they could not have paid me a, bill, a million or a billion U.S. to make me change my mind at that time. Got you. And uh, Dr. Bishnu, um, what are um, the limitations on parliamentarians in, the, in Trinidad um, on their conscious voting? Can they vote their conscience or not? Definitely. Parliamentarians in Trinidad can vote their conscience. That's in right. Fact, the, it's a, many years ago we passed a, a crossing of the floor act. Uh, however, it was never really implemented. So a member of the government can simply vote with the opposition and vice versa. It, there's simply no restriction at all to conscience voting within the parliament. Of course, there's always the whip who will want to say um, that you should vote in line with what the whip suggests. Mm -hmm. But in the context of Trinidad, there's no such 
uh, limitations. You are allowed to vote your conscience. And I think um, in Guyana, I, I understand the, the issue that you cannot vote against your list, but I somehow I don't think that that applies always to all motions in the context that you are not allowed to vote according to your conscience. Dr. Vishnu, if I may, when it says you can vote against the list, it does not say that you cannot vote against the list, you know. The article is quite clear. You must inform the speaker of your intention to so do. It doesn't say you can't vote against the list, but you must give the speaker in writing your intention to so do. It was not my intention to vote against the list. I was yes. simply looking at the, the arguments, and at that stage, it was not a premeditated anything. I knew then that I would vote in support of the motion. Now, you can deem that to be against the lift or against the government because that is what it is. But was I voting against the government or was I voting in support of a motion that was tabled and debated in Parliament? Again, there's like a six of one, half dozen of the other. Once I've done that, as I did, it means or it meant that I voted against the government. And so, move it up one step backwards or further, I have voted against the list. I want to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Bishnuyat a question. So there's 41 MPs in Trinidad. What is now, the majority? Yeah. What's the ma majority in Trinidad? Majority one, one, 21. <laughs> 21. Majority just, 21. I just wanted to get that on the record. No, you, you see, the thing about it, uh, several years ago we had an election where we had 36 seats. And we had right. an 18 18 tie. And All the in time. Order that we, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And in order that we got away from that 18 18 or that tie position, we. It entered, was in 2000 that they legislated law to make it 42 yes, or 41. 41. So, yes. for all intents and purposes, we have gone through that process already. We have decided and agreed <coughs> that we put in an odd number there, and the odd number there is to ensure that. We always have a clear majority, one way or the other. So you have right. matured as a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they have moved. Trinidad has moved from a from, from a, an even to an odd. We might have to move from an odd to an even. You know, but Jamaica, see how that Jamaica, goes. Jamaica also. You know, Jamaica moved from an even to an odd. Yes. And not too long ago, I think it was two thousand and two. So, well, um, with that, Sharon, uh, Brother Sharon Das Prasad, I want to uh, thank you very much for the time you spent with us today. I know uh, Dr. Bishnu has to um, uh, leave us uh, in a few minutes. So I want to thank you for your call and um, thank you for um, allowing Guyana to kind of go under the skin and examine um, what are some of the functions that might not be working in our favor. And uh, right. please, uh, we look forward to a hearing soon. And whichever direction it goes, uh, we hope you continue to uh, be a, uh, a good citizen of Guyana and, and continue to play okay. your role. Thank you very much. My brother, may I give you 10 seconds of contribution here? Very Absolutely. quickly. I don't mind at all. Well, I shouldn't say I don't mind. But whichever party wins this election that's coming, there is going to be an election. Definitely. Whether we lose the appeal is going to be in 2020. But I'm hoping that they look at all the mess that we have discovered here with our constitution, with the parliament, with the judiciary, with everything, and fix it. Yep. Can I stick one Thank last you. question in for Charandas? This is a five-second answer. Are you yes. planning to go back to Guyana soon? I have to, my friend. I live there. But well, I just thank want Camrat I want Camrat to be removed first. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, that's something you and him will have to deal with, you know. And then yep. you, uh, if if you vote, you just I think you still have a right to vote. So if you go back and you vote uh, in whichever direction you feel like, uh, you could probably um, aid in removing him. All right. I well, did um, say I was going to surprise Camrade and Leslie James, and when I make a particular announcement, they will be shocked shitless. The two of them. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Thank you very much, my brothers. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, have a right. good day. Thank you. Yeah, you too. All uh, right. Well, Dr. Bishnu, okay. just, just yes. remind me, um, how many minutes more do you have with us? I, ha I am about to leave. Okay. I'm, about, <laughs> I'm about to say my thank yous to having me on the program. Okay, but, but as part of your thank you, our next subject that we're going to um, lead into is conflict of interest. 
And I would love for you to give uh, your thoughts on conflict of interest uh, from your perspective and from your experience as a political scientist um, in the Caribbean uh, landscape as well as in Trinidad landscape. Well, conflict of interest has, is literally coming up more and more as to exactly how people play their part and what are they supposed to be doing. Um, and what should they be declaring? One of the concerns we have had in Trinidad, for instance, I, and I know you probably would have heard it, for instance, within more recent times where uh, a building was rented by the government and, and the, from the attorney general, and there was a concern whether there is conflict of interest, whether he sat in the cabinet and made a decision for his own, uh, in his own interest. And those are some of the concerns that, that remain pegged with us. We have to deal with it. We have to ensure that there's a certain degree of ethics and integrity as we move forward. And what we are, have to call upon our people now is to ensure that they stand by what is right, do the right thing, and not hope that somebody else will find it out and tell them about it as we move along. Is there a code of ethics for Trinidadian politicians? There is a code of ethics for parliamentarians. And I should tell you that within Trinidad and Tobago for the last general election, We've gone one step further and we set up a code of ethical political conduct. Mm -hmm. I am the chair of that the council which has been mandated to monitor and evaluate the adherence to that code. And we are doing all our, in our interest to make sure that politicians stay within a proper and acceptable standard of conduct in conducting themselves, especially as they did. They, they go on the political platforms in preparation for an election. All right. So I don't want to hold you back any further unless you want to say anything else. But uh, thank you very much for being here with us and sharing your, uh, your ideas and your uh, feedback uh, with our audience. It has been my pleasure and I will be available to you should you want me again. We, would, we would love to. Have, I actually personally yes. would love to have you back. You are, you're fantastic, man. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Vishnu. Okay, all right. Have a great day. Uh, well, with that, I want to ask Devin, um, do you have any questions from our local live audience or on Facebook that you might want to share with the panelists at this moment? Yes, we have some comments from our online audience from YouTube. Uh, Delight says, do a better job in the interest of fairness. For example, what is gleaned from a panel who are all against the government? And no panel should ever consist of one in the city if you are seeking true equilibrium. Poor judgment on your end. We have another comment on Facebook that says, Everyone on this panel is Indian and shares the view of the PPP, see the optics. And another comment on Facebook says, from Kwesi Kendall, We should talk about the optics in the CCJ. All government lawyers are black, all opposi opposition lawyers are Indian. Uh, and thank you. Are there any more? No, that's it for now. Oh, oh well, thank you very much. And those are very um, excellent observation. I, I'm quite sure everyone in the world noticed that um, about the attorneys, uh, the disparity between the ethnicity. And, and that's quite natural uh, because Guyan itself is so polarized uh, ethnically. Um, and just about everything else uh, you, can, uh, you can do or say in Guyana can be tainted along that line. But I don't want to be the guy saying it. I want to have my guests talk about that. Um, are, we, um, are we pandering to the PPP uh, as Indians by default? Um, or can an Indian be fair? Can an Indian be equitable and fair? I, I would like to jump in because uh, I... I wanted to tell you two weeks ago. Um, this I'm not aware, show, by the way, say that you are a PPP. No, no. Two I, weeks ago, I, I know you two were weeks once ago, AFC. two weeks ago, this show had an all-black panel, and I looked at it, and I actually enjoyed the show because I wasn't focused on the color of the person's skin. I was focused on the message, and Dr. David Hines was good. Um, Dr. Troy Thomas was good. Their message was exactly the same thing we're talking about today, conflict of interest. So I believe that more often than not, uh, we have to grow up and start focusing on the message. And if you look at this message today, 
um, at least from the sitting panelists um, who were here, I have not heard anybody taking the position of this is the PNC or that is the PN that is the PPP. Nobody's taken a pro party position, but it's clear, you know. Sometimes you gotta self-assess yourself, and if you self-assess yourself, and you know within your conscience that you you're messaging an issue and not a particular party position, then you gotta just say, well, tough. I would say to that, that person, tough, because I've evaluated what I've said so far. I've evaluated what Nicholas has said. I've evaluated what Dr. Um, Bisnudat has said. And none of it was, oh, this is, well, this is good for the PBP or this is good for the PNC. We don't care. I don't care who wins the next election. What I care about is democracy and that democracy is maintained and protected in Guyana and integrity is maintained and, and, and protected in Guyana and conflict of interest is reduced in Guyana and the rule of law is followed. Now, my skin color has nothing to do with those concepts. Nothing. And uh, Nicholas, can, and my, my question was, can an Indian or a panel of Indians be fair and equitable in their discussion? Uh, and, that, and that's a very interesting question because, I mean, let me ask, the, the key is, you know, the people who are observing, clearly they still see some racial bias in, in along party lines. But I, I would tell you something, the new generation of exactly. leaders and the people that I interact with on a daily basis at the Georgetown Chamber, the young business guys and, and ladies who are coming up, we don't see color. Exactly. It's not about color. We just took a mission to Houston. The mission was all sorts of different hues of people from Guyana. And nobody looked at each other and said, okay, well, you know, you must be of this race, so you must be supporting this party. No, we looked at this as we were Guyanese. Mm -hmm. My views are about, you know, as you said, the rule of democracy. It's not about a particular party. In fact, I would say my views are really, you know, espoused about maybe by age bias because what we see is we, as, a, as my generation and younger, we're highly individualistic. That's why, like, my first comments about what I saw being said about party paramountcy wasn't about, you know, a particular political party. It was just, in general, I don't want to ever see party paramountcy. Now, if you go on to, like, what we see for the future, can, and, and, and your question in, at core, can we be objective? Yes, because I've taken a number of positions, some supporting the government, some supporting the opposition. I, my positions are in the, in the national interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, excellent. And Devin, um, can you uh, please uh, list the number that uh, viewers can call in? Uh, I've been receiving some messages on Facebook um, for that number. I don't have it, of course, but if you can um, post it on the screen, that would be great. Um, so uh, with that, I would love to get back on track. Um, conflict on of interest. Conflict of interest, right? <laughs> We've had quite a lot of conflicts. and, um, and uh, but, but here, you know, uh, let, let's start off with what conflict of interest is and if there is um, conflicts in Guyana. Uh, I mean, conflict of interest in itself uh, has been around as long as there has been human beings. Mm -hmm. And Guyana did not invent nope. uh, conflict of interest. Uh, Guyana did not perfect it. Um, of course, we indulge in it. Um, uh, uh, like uh, like so many other politicians around the world, in the U.S. itself, you know, we are battling here with a president that may have multiple um, uh, multiple uh, uh, conflict of interests around the world and in the United States. You know, so, and and he's uh, embroiled in, in a lot of uh, investigations. So let's talk about what is what is what is conflict of interest as it relates to Guyana. And I would love to, to, to have um, the take of both of you gentlemen. All right. All right. Um, well, m Mr. Moderator, l l let's think in cricketing parlance. So let's walk down this pitch. To I want to just define conflict, conflict of interest because when uh, the producers mentioned this show, I wanted to make sure I understand what it is properly. Um, so in my research, I found that conflict of interest describes a set of circumstances in which an individual, secondary, private interest 
excessively influences their primary professional interests. So to properly understand this concept, we must understand that if you're professionally committed to a purpose, you're expected to avoid activities, agreements, business investments, or other situations that materially conflicts with that primary professional purpose, right? So let me just use an example to bring some real op optics to this situation. So please allow me to bat a little bit here. Um, once upon a time, there was a lady called Joan. She was hired by a boss to be a head of department. She's a hired help, right? Let us make that clear. But by some machination, Joan's husband was awarded all the contracts coming out of her department, which she heads. Um, but Joan is the key decision maker in this department. How does that optics look? That's one case. The second case I want to mention is once upon a time, there was a woman called Mary. She was also hired by her boss. Um, let's say a head of government. She was hired by a head of government and as a minister in the government. And again, again, she's hired help. So she, let's make that clear. But quite intriguingly, several contracts running into millions of dollars was awarded to this company owned by Mary, who's a minister of utilities, in which she is the decision-making power. How again does that optics look? Let me let, deal with the last example. Um, just allow me to, 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 to make this last four runs on it. Once upon a time, there was a boy called Joseph Stalin. I was hoping you can go to some boys, though, because you were, <laughs> you, you were hitting the women there kind of a, hard. There, there was a boy called Joseph Stalin. He was the son of a... Of, of, of the CEO of a company who hired him to manage large projects. But he was not adequately experienced or skilled for the job. But he still got the job to do this big project. The company ended up losing billions of dollars because the entire project failed because Joseph Stalin obviously wasn't skilled enough. Again, how does the optics look? So this brings out the issue. Three solid cases of of fictional characters, um, but illustrating how public officials in, can engage in material conflict of interest away from their primary professional purpose. And, and Nicholas, uh, what are your um, thoughts on, con in terms of definition for conflict of interest from a private sector pr perspective, and more so, what are the dangers if, if we were to engage in such activities? Yes, so let, let's let's tackle what what the real hot button topic is. The topic, the, the 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 conflict of interest that everybody really wants to talk about is the conflict of interest in the public procurement system. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. that is the one that is really center stage. And I mean, I, I should backpedal a second and say that the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry has a code of conduct that we expect all our members to adhere to. And in it, you know, there are certain things that kind of define that we expect all members to operate ethically. Now, that aside, coming back to your core concern here, I think the public procurement system has a number of gaps. Now, we have to give some credit to this government that they implemented the, the procurement commission. We won't talk about circumstances surrounding it or how it came into being or when it came into being and the speed at which it was implemented, but it was implemented. Exactly. Exactly. But the key here is that there are still gaps. If you can have procurement, um, if one, you have contract splitting has been an issue. Um, two, you have the, the, the direct conflict of interest where you have people who are in public positions holding private interests in the companies. And when they're going up for work, um, either A, is felt that the work was not publicly bidded, you know, bid out, or B, if the work was publicly bid out, the companies did not report who were the direct owners or beneficiaries. Let me tell you something. In the the new industry that's coming up, the oil industry, they have they are very beholden to the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And when you go into their procurement systems, right, they require you to declare the ultimate beneficiaries. They require you to declare whether they're any politically exposed. Because for them, it's conflict of interest, anti-money laundering, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that are really 
going through their heads when they look at um, this part of the procurement section uh, section when they, they're going out to, to procure, right? And they want to know that the companies that they're selling services or products to them have no connection to any public officials, or if it is, it is publicly declared and people have you know said that, okay, there's no undue influence on the award of contract. Secondly, that there is no you know kind of pay to play um, strategies going on. So these are things that we need to inculcate into our government procurement because that that is what the gap is 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 is, is causing the, the gap or the lack of this stringency in our public procurement is allowing these situations to come about. Now you'll have a number of these situations, and and as long as you have this public procurement system that has these gaps, no matter who's in power, you're going to have these issues. Yeah. Now, what you've just outlined are some, I think, fundamental um, safeguards for conflict of interest. So why do you believe they're not part of the current Public Procurement um, Commission Act? Sorry. Well, I'll put it this way. Something was put in. You, you came from zero, and you now have something. What we have to do is work towards strengthening that something. But I'll tell you what I see, though, is that we can look at the declarations to the Integrity Commission, mm -hmm. and that should be a guide as to whether or, you know we feel that the, the politicians as a whole, this political group as a whole, is willing to take those steps to, let's say, safeguard the Guyanese population, knowing that they are taking serious steps to reduce corruption. So I know we walked all the way from conflict of interest mm -hmm. to corruption, but it's important that we talk about everything as a whole, yeah. not just piece by piece, right? Yeah. Because if, the, if you saw a lot more declarations to the Integrity Commission, you can then feel comfortable that should we lobby for an improvement in the public procurement system, we would see that implemented. So what I'm looking at is the spirit or the intention, right? And that I don't see that spirit or intention, it leads me to believe that it will be a hard fought battle to get improvement in the public procurement system done. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and say, sir, based on what uh, Nicholas mentioned, um, it goes without say that individuals who enter the political arena uh, and, and wins a leadership position uh, would have access to power and resources and would want to use those power and resources to their advantage, uh, to their constituency, which it should be. Uh, but they, they may have a few who would have personal interests in a in certain area. Um, uh, do, do you believe that we have enough safeguards in um, the, the procurement acts as well as other laws in Guyana? Um, or are they strong enough uh, to ensure that we it, it reduces the impact of conflict of interest? Well, I, I want to agree with Nicholas is that we started from something and we're climbing and growing. Um, obviously, we know that Guyana is a far way off um, from the standards that we know in the United States. But if anyone is to look at the collection of laws that Guyana has, Guyana has a fair amount of laws covering a wide angle of things. The problem with Guyana is enforcement of the law. That is where the challenge is. And it's because the, the regulators are always fearful that the political people will come for them. So everybody walks on, on eggshells, so to speak. But in the eyes of the, in a normal functional system, in the eyes of the regulator, the tone at the bottom of the of the structure of the procurement structure and the tone at the middle of the procurement structure will define the tone at the top so we saw the other day some low level pro professional in the ministry of finance was going in after 6 into the safe room stealing documents switching pages out um, it has become a culture within the public procurement system that everything is a hustle and 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 um the problem is, you look at the police uh, fraud squad or SOKU and these organizations, they're toothless poodles, bottom line. So, the, the, you know, if somebody's caught doing something like that, within a matter of months, he should be in jail, not pooch punching and, and delaying and wasting time 
um, uh, on him. He should become, the, the, the society should galvanize around the issue to make an example out of that individual. But obviously this guy is going to get off because he has sponsorship elsewhere at the top. Because and, and this is the challenge. The other thing is uh, that, that that Nicholas raised was this foreign um, uh, for foreign foreign corrupt practice act, mm -hmm. which basically clearly makes it it's very clear there, because I, on some of the projects that I had worked in my previous professional life, third party compliance is essential. So, a big company like Exxon will not put their reputation at risk for some corrupt little guy in, who who's trying to do runnings out to Guyana. They will just bypass him and go to a to to a provider in Trinidad or 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 um Texas and let that person do the work for them in Guyana because they're not gonna play. And this is a very, very important because with this big oil investment, it's going to drive a different culture. So when people start complaining, oh, we're not going to get contracts, they need to understand you need to get up to speed. And I'm glad that uh, there's these interactions happening with uh, the Georgetown Chamber and the Private Sector Commission with the, the, the oil providers because it, it, it allows, as what Nicholas was saying, that build up to continue happening. But that build up is only happening in the private sector. What is happening in the public sector is, the, is my concern. Absolutely. And uh, with that, I just want to remind our viewers that if you're looking at this, uh, please like the um, Globespan 24-7 Facebook page as well as share it to your friends and families. Uh, I think, uh, Devin, we do. We have a caller from Trinidad, from Canada um, who is interested in joining th this discussion and may have some questions for us. Um, you can put him on. Uh, I just want to remind the caller that we are speaking about conflict of interest and would appreciate and, of course, enjoy his contribution. We apologize, but we currently lost the caller and we are trying to get him back. As soon as we get him back, we will let you know. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, do you have any questions uh, for from the audience? We have one from the online audience. Just give us one moment. From the in-house audience, sorry. So, so, okay. S Salim? Yes, um, I wanted to tell you um, the practice that I've been exposed to, and I know this is what a lot of people are doing. When in doubt with regards to conflict of interest, the simple thing to do is to, as the old people say, just ask yourself ask people around you hey how does this look if i do so 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 um and that will help people to work through conflict of interest and to be able to build up their strength with regards to following the system i'll give you a case in point um in in my current job you know if you get a basket of fruits at christmas from somebody who felt you're a great provider you got to declare it yep you got to disclose it. And if you don't want to disclose it, then you distribute it to your staff. <laughs> Bottom line. But you cannot pick that basket of fruits. A, a fruit, simple fruits, and take it home without disclosing it. Mm -hmm. Because if the, if the organization gets to find out, you're done. Yeah. You'll be going to be cited because you violated a code of conduct. And yeah. this brings me to the point. Um, in the 2015 manifesto, uh, the... APNU AFC coalition had proposed in their manifesto, which was good, that within the first 100 days they were going to roll out uh, a code of co uh, conduct for all senior officials, all ministers, and so forth. Now, something was rolled out, but have you ever read it? It is no. such a weak document. It doesn't have teeth. So if somebody decides that they want to give their own company um, contracts, publicly funded contracts. That person keeps their job. They're not even transferred. They keep their job. And that, for me, tells you there's not a political commitment at the very top towards cleaning up the corruption and conflict of interest in Guyana. Yeah. And, uh, and I know conflict of interest is not, like you mentioned, says, is not only a gov government issue. 
but corporations and businesses and so on um, can be embroiled in it. Um, uh, Nicholas, how does the private sector and the private, the private sector organizations um, safeguard itself or at least help, help uh, others within the uh, business community as well as the government to look at conflict of interest and address it and look at ways of, of safeguarding itself? So for the, for the members of the chamber, again, as I mentioned, we have a code of conduct that we encourage everybody to adhere to. So that's from the chamber's perspective. Um, from private companies, we all are subject to anti-money laundering regulations, which you know, if you're a politi uh, politically exposed person, you have to do some amount of declarations. So that, that also does some coverage. From a lobbying point of view, clearly the regulator, the Public Procurement Commission, needs some more teeth because te what, what is being shown is that they don't have enough teeth and that they don't have the, the strength to operate in the way that they should so that they can prevent the, at least expose this conflict of interest so that when they're going into the, 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 the process of award, people are aware. Because you, you're going to have, you know, when in a small country like ours, you're going to have some cross ownership of businesses and stuff. But this stuff should be declared and read out and understood that, you know, this that this person owns or is a beneficiary of this. And they have put forward a bid and the bid can either be evaluated or, or not evaluated at that point. But everybody is aware and understands that. Mm -hmm. So we have to develop that. But going back to what Say says, indeed, this thing has to come from a culture. So the, the, the leaders at the top, have to set the culture and then everybody else will be able to take their actions. The regulators will feel no fear in taking their actions. Companies will feel that they should take the onus on themselves to disclose up front. But if you don't have that tone at the top, and this is not um, at a particular party, this is how all of our political leaders need to set that tone. And that's why I was referring to the Integrity Commission. If you saw complete declarations from everybody, you'd feel the tone was there, but you don't see that. And then you come down to Soku, which which says mentioned. I mean, Soku itself can't account for how some monies are spent. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, clearly, and and I know we're using the term conflict of interest, but I'm using conflict of interest as well as the potential for corruption. Corruption, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. And, and a follow-up question to that would be: uh, election is coming up, and you kind of touched it a little bit in your in your brief presentation. That election is coming up, whether it's three months or nine months or you know a year, um, uh, and companies, uh, political parties are going to go to corporations and companies in Guyana and seek uh, uh, you know, donation, yeah. campaign donation. Uh, and, and the campaign donation ethics and everything has a different discussion. But how how does um, how how does the business community uh, want to give money? And knowing fully well that there might be contracts coming up in the next government, that uh, you know how how does this entire dynamics uh, play out? And how should we protect voters? How do we protect um, our leaders? our political leaders and how do we protect businesses and how do we protect, um, you know, the, the entire landscape of, 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 of communities in Guyana to, to uh, uh, you know, that relationship between politicians and businesses and the, and the, the campaign funds, how do we, so, what, so what me, buffers are there? So let me, let me talk about your question and, I, and I'll, I'll go off on a tangent for two seconds towards the end of the answer. So clearly, there is need for campaign finance laws. This this has been debated and talked about, and everybody said that they're going to implement it, yes or no. But there needs to be campaign finance laws in place that safeguard the general population from people who are able to you know, donate and then lobby after giving sizable donations. Because what are we talking about sizable donations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can't, we, we're not the type of democracy that should not encourage people if they feel to support a party, they should be able to support the party. But that support should be, you know, channeled in a way that does not cause conflict of interest after, let's say, you know, successful support. 
So that's that's the key here, and campaign finance laws have to protect against that. In addition to that, um, where a seller is going to go off on a tangent, because usually what's going to happen is that you're going to have some large businesses or influential people be able to influence your politicians. And what's going what's going to happen is the smaller business people, the entrepreneurs, are going to get hurt when contracts come out. We also need to work to to really give effect to our laws that govern small businesses and giving contracts to small businesses. That way, you know, because I, I know it may seem kind of unrelated, but believe me, when, when a lot of contracts are going to come out, you know, you need to be able to at least say small businesses can get a bite of this. So from a small business looking at it, I want to know that one, I can get a bite of some business that's coming out, and two, that I'm safeguarded, that, you know, I'm small, I can't really go and give large donations to the party. The, yeah. the contracts that are going to be given are going to be won by merit, not by the donation I made or did not make. And, and you mentioned that we need to work on this, we need to uh, build this and so on. Who is the we? The we is Guyanese. This we is definitely is, is, is the young... When you say Guyanese, Guyanese is a very general word. Uh, could that, no, no, no. Let does me, that we me, include me. private sector, government, uh, I, I don't know. All because I've heard, I've heard many times that we need to change constitution, we need to do this, we need to do that. But I've never seen a, a specific indication of who that we is. And, and so, so I, I define that we as all stakeholders because what I look at is that in Guyana, there, I, there was a Guyana 1.0, and we need to start talking about the Guyana 2.0. And the Guyana 2.0 is going to have funds coming in from an oil industry. That Guyana 2.0 needs to ensure that it has a, a, a sovereign wealth fund in place, needs to ensure that it has a regula uh, regulatory body for the oil industry in place. Mm -hmm. That Guyana 2.0 needs to ensure that its uh, leaders are held accountable, right? From the Integrity Commission, from public procurement, from you know the laws governing um, conflict of interest, anti-money laundering, from a proper oper operationalization of the, the SOKU arm of the police, whether they keep that, change the unit, because I mean SOKU at this point has had so much press around it, both some small some positive, some negative, but I think that you know it 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 is not functioning according to the mandate it's given. So clearly, mm -hmm. all stakeholders, and let me now define, private businesses, public agencies, government, you know, labor, um, the rest of civil society, religious organizations, we all need to be on the same page because the Guy Guyana belongs to us. Going back to what I said earlier, this is about where we were joking about um, the, the, the party paramountcy and the representation of the people. This is the people. Right? This is the definition of the people. And if we don't push for this, these type of changes in our country, we're going to be at a loss because you only need to look to Venezuela right? Mm -hmm. Venezuela sits on 300 billion barrels of oil. They should be the wealthiest country in the world. 50 million people in 300 billion barrels of oil. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, a, a system, right? And a system, here's a definition from everything from the political system down to how businesses do business. If you have a system that is corrupt and broken, we can end up like them. And we need to ensure that that does not happen. Good. I think we have a caller, um, on on the line he's wants to get online bevan devon yes one second thank you nicholas for uh quite frank the we no problem <laughs> hello caller you're on the line. Devin, uh, is he still online? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, proceed. Is this Charles Sugram? Hello. Yes, this is Charles Sugram. Oh, hello, Charles. How are you doing? A former moderator of this show. 
<laughs> Great job. I, I really am following the conflict of interest uh, that you guys are discussing, and I think the information is amazing and it's really good. But what I what I want to reflect in in this call and just ask a question at the end is um, here in the United States, we follow recently when. Um, the Attorney General in the Trump administration recused himself from mm-hmm. listening, from hearing the um, the case against the Russian interference in the election, mm-hmm. and that is a conflict of interest because within the Justice Department there is a format they follow to recuse oneself from that hearing. Mm-hmm. We also hear of President Trump, um, people staying at his hotel, and that uh, kind of. Um, it kind of conflict with the Monument Clause here in the United States. Going back to Guyana, um, in the case of Cathy Hughes, which her company that um, was given a huge contract, the thing is, did that contract did, did it enrich her? And the question is, yes, because she is the owner of the company. And being a government minister, you cannot now enjoy the fruit of a company that you formed that you own and you're the, you're, the, you're the boss, and at the same time enjoy the fruit of being a government minister. That is definitely a clear conflict of interest. But I'm saying that in, within that context itself, we need to look at, it's a really broad area, and there are many case laws that uh, actually rule on that. For instance, if you're an auditor, like SIS and I are, if you're auditors, and within that audit, you are auditing a company that you have shares in, in the stock market. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a clear so evidence of a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. you will not be allowed to, to audit that company. You have to, you know, be, be recruit yourself in that company. Mm-hmm. And that is what I need to, to understand within the Guyana context, is that we seem to take something, if it, if it benefits me, that's okay, but it benefits someone else, it's not okay. And unless we make a ruling to say that this is what it will be, regardless who the individual is, I think we continue to have that problem in Ghana. And guys, but, great job. But, 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 but what I'm well, hearing... But, but let, me just, let me just add, Charles. Um, I mean, Guyana has the Integrity Act. It has the Procurement Act. It has the, the Audit Act. It has the Fisc, uh, Fiscal Management and, uh, and Accountability Act. It has a, a whole milieu of laws that have clauses in there that protects the treasury. Um, the unfortunate fact is that people tend to try to skirt around the clauses or twist the interpretation of the clauses uh, when it comes to their own personal welfare. And the question that I always ask when it comes to conflict of interest is who benefits from the profit of the activity? Who benefited from the profit of the construction company? Who benefited benefited from the profits of the 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 um, the public relations company? And when you drill down to that question, and you realize where the profit ends up, then you will say clearly it's a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, excellent, well, that uh, point, please. Charles, I want to thank you very much for your call. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, you playing a role in, in molding that new Guyana. All okay, right, guys. so guys, um, uh, back to our subject of conflict of interest. Um, uh, I, I know we've been talking about it in general terms. Um, how about, uh, I know we've spoken specifically about Video Mega and so on. Are there other, uh, 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 other cases of conflict of interest that we can probably highlight that can demonstrate well, uh, uh, well, you know I, what's wrong with our system i i actually believe that we've at the juncture now where we need to fix it so i don't want to be blaming anybody i think there's enough evidence out there to ascertain what has happened from 1966 to now people know people know what has happened it's not the guy needs people there's one thing we must confess are a bunch of very aware and smart people. They know what's going on. They're not fools. They know exactly what's going on. But what I more would want to try to focus my mind at least to add a little bit to this debate is what can we do from now onwards? And I'm hope, hoping President Granger is listening for the few days that he has left until the elections. At least he can do something that is serious. First of all, 
I believe all heads of department should be taken to some degree of training to understand this whole concept of conflict of interest, what we should do, what we should not do, what is transparable, transparent, what is not transparent, uh, you know, what is allowable, what is not allowable. So I believe a national training can happen. I mean, yeah, maybe a couple more billions can be spent, but I can tell you, they can do this on the cheap if they want by just asking the Catholic bishop or Pandor, Pandit Rudra Sharma or the CIOG people to come together. And those people will, will tell them in very simple terms what can be done or what not be done. But, but that's me being jo jovial around the issue. Training is definitely needed to, for heads of department, um, anybody who heads an organization and can make spending decision. The second thing that needs to be done is that from the very top, you remember they got that sign that was on the president's desk, um, I think it's Truman's desk, um, the box stops here. The minute something happens, the guy who the box stops at needs to take action. Swift, definitive action. Why do you, why do you believe or you're assuming that President Granger has not been taking action? Um, and, is, and is his, is his immob immobility to deal with these issues, is that, a, quote unquote, a case of conflict of interest? Would it be? Because it might be his son-in-law, who is like the, you know the the, the Ministry of, of Business, who uh, brought in very little investments, for example. Um, uh, you know, what, what what would be the cause for or the reasoning for uh, President Granger not taking swift action, as you as you as you talked about, um, to deal with these conflict of interest issues as well as maybe corruption issues, which they of course, um, campaigned heavily um, um, in 2015 against the PPP. Alam, you want me to live in Mr. Granger's mind. I don't know what he's thinking. But um, what I can tell you is that he stood on a platform. And but is that, a, is, is that a conflict of interest? In that he's not speaking out on these issues at, uh, as a president? Isn't his, isn't his job to straighten the ranks? Well, they said that he's a man who don't speak a lot. I mean, he's the, the man who's held to what, two press conferences in four years or something like that. I don't know how much, but it's not a lot. But um, So he doesn't speak a lot. But what at least you would have expected is executive action. Um, and I'm not here soliciting people to be fired. That's not my job. But what I'm saying is that if a conflict of interest occurred within a ministry, that at minimum, they should have been shifting of roles. I know some people are calling it musical chair, chairs, but um, for me, a shifting of roles would have at least demonstrated to the public in an election year that we, we're serious about, about fixing this. Today, they issued a statement saying a uh, four-year anniversary. This, we have something to celebrate that we have battled corruption. Now, I mean, you want comedy? That's comedy. Because here you have many, many cases of conflict of interest. And, and this only didn't happen only the other day. You know, remember one of them went off on some plane, uh, in a Chinese plane for an investor. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's all, all these cases are happening. But the question is, um, what is being done? And the question is, nothing is being done. The answer is, nothing is being done. So we have real situations of conflict of interest, right, left, and center in this government. And we had cases of it in the previous government. I am not here telling you only the, 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 this government is, has misbehaved. There have been many, many cases in the previous government. But what I am expecting is the society led by the politician and civil society moving forward, moving upward. So in 2015, uh, the coalition said to the public, we are going to be better than our predecessors. Give us a chance. Fine. The people give you a chance. Have you demonstrated you're better? You have not. So Guyanese all across the country, whether it is ra from, from racial, different racial background, different religious background, different class background, they're generally, especially the youths, are in broad agreement 
that corruption is rife in Guyana today. And um, people want some, some action. People want some heads to roll so that they can feel, that they can contain this malady of, 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 um, of, of inconsistent actions before it graduated yeah. to something terminal, you know? This could yeah, really, this could really become dangerous. Whereby Guyana can graduate to an equatorial no. Guinea, or Guyana could graduate to a Congo, where their, their, they, you know, their government are literally malfunctional, yeah. or even a Venezuela. Guyana could soon graduate to a Venezuela. Yeah, and, and conflict of interest is another one of those um, uh, areas that can that can move us in that direction very very quickly. Oh, very uh, very. We've got we have constitutional crisis that's taken us in that direction. We've got conflict of interest. We have corruption. Uh, we've got oil that can slip us slip us into that direction even faster. Mm. So with that, uh, there's one we have we don't have much time left. Probably around two to three minutes left on this show. Um, I, we have one caller. Um, who we will take, and then we will go to our closing remarks and bring this uh, town hall to a close. Hello, caller. Are you on? One Devin, second. do we have a caller? Yes, one second. Hello? Hello? Apologize for the technical Wayne. delays, but uh, please proceed. Your name, please? The name is Wayne Ford. Hey, Wayne Ford, how are you doing? Good. Is this Salim? Yes, it is. Hi, hi. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. Thank you very uh, much. So, go, go right ahead. Uh, you, can, you, you, you can make a statement and a question if you wish. Yeah, great. Great show you're having. Thank um, you. This is not just in particular to conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is a symptom of many other problems that exist in Guyana. And one of the things that we recognize is that there are many gaps, and these gaps cause deficiencies in institutions. And these deficiencies exist in the public sector and the private sector. So Guyana has uh, deficiencies in human capital, it has it in financial capital. This has led to a culture, as I think C said earlier, there's a culture in Guyana that's ingrained in the way things are done. Absolutely. And my question, based on what I heard Mr. Boyer say in a in an, uh, video with a young fellow the other day, uh, he indicated that the millennials in the diaspora have to play a part. He indicated that there has to be new knowledge, and we have to bring change to Guyana through the diaspora. So I wanted him to comment on that in terms of what the uh, GCCI, the chamber, will be doing to engage the diaspora effectively to help alleviate some of these problems, how to build and build capacity in the institutions and the combination therein. And as you know, we have an organization that is pulling the Guyanese organizations together so that we can assist, so that we can build bridges and form alliances with uh, the, yes. uh, the chamber, with the PFC, with mm -hmm. other organizations in Guyana to help build the capacity to address not just conflict of interest, but the cultural um, behavior that is ingrained uh, nationally in Guyana that will not change just from an internal um, set of uh, objectives and actions. So I yeah. want to ask Mr. Well, Boyer how he is going to... Um, to what strategies in place to engage the diaspora? Uh, and um, thank before, you, Wayne Ford. Be, before, Mr. before Mr. Ford go, please share your number with Salim so we can share it with uh, Mr. Boyer so we can build that alliance immediately. Yes, you know? I'll, I'll, I have his number. I'll, I'll send it to to the team. Uh, well, Wayne, thanks a lot for calling, and uh, maybe at some future time you can be a guest on this show to talk about the new platform you've created to bring awareness of what the outside Guyanese can do for the inside Guyanese. Let, let, let me take a quick okay, stab. Thank you. Let me take a quick stab to answer what we said. I mean, clearly what we have to recognize is that Guyana has a very large diaspora and, our, and, and a lot of our diaspora have been very successful. So to build the Guyana 2.0 that, that I was referencing, we certainly have to engage with them. So that, that is recognized. How we do it, from the chamber's perspective, the chamber has some mechanisms it, it um, you know, uses consistently, for instance, twinning with other chambers. 
In addition to that, we can create MOUs with groups who are, you know, legitimate groups who are ready to engage and do business. Uh, when I was in Houston last week, I met with a Caribbean Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, I met with some of the Guyanese diaspora who were in Houston. So what the Chamber is doing is trying to forge these formal partnerships to bring that energy from the diaspora, because again, the diaspora has resources, has knowledge, and we definitely agree that we need to use those. So the, the, the short answer is that through formal partnerships, such as creating you know, MOUs or twinning with other chambers, and then creating avenues, whether it's events, programs, speaking engagements, to engage with the diaspora. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know we have a, a, a question from our live audience in Richmond Hill. We'll go to that question and then we'll go to our closing remarks by our panelists. Thank yes, you very I, much. I'd like to talk to like you more Yes, I'd like to thank the panelists for sharing their ideas today. But um, I would like to ask you guys how you deal with a, a disease of corruption in Guyana where it seems to me like no ethics exist in government agency? Very good question. Thank you very much. Um, guys, you can take it from there. And maybe you can include that as part of your closing statements. Since you want to go. All right. Um, before I go to, get to the closing, let me answer that question. Um, it is a disease, and it has to be worked on like any disease. It's a healing process. It's not going to happen instantaneously because the corrupt attitude of mind that we have in Guyana didn't develop in 2019. It started since from before our independence all the way coming. We had a corrupt form of political system when we lost democracy between 1968 to 1992. That engendered a lot of uh, corruption, not just politically, economically. Businessmen had to bend backward over and do all sorts of stuff to survive. I mean, you think about the, the backtrack trade from Suriname with the flower, you know, lots of monies were passing to keep business going at that point in time. So it engendered a, a long-standing attitude of mind. Um, what I was expecting um, after reading the 2015 manifesto of the coalition is that they were going to, to walk it back and try to clean up. Now, I have not seen any cleanup in conflict of interest, corrupt activity, crime. All these things are corruption of some, of, of, of some sort. Um, these things have actually intensified. So um, we need to give it time. But before we give it time, let's be clear. It has to be incrementally improving. And I'm not seeing that in incremental improving. Um, in closing, I want to say in most countries, um, they are increasing expectations from ordinary citizens, business leaders and civil society that government should lead on the delivery of higher standard of integrity. But I'm saying in Guyana's case, because the disease is so pervasive, um, I believe the churches needs to step up. All the churches needs to step up. I mean, How church, doctors? <laughs> morality doesn't happen only in a church, a building. It happens in day-to-day -day interaction. And I believe that the, the, the churches, and when I say churches, I mean church, masjid, uh, temples, um, Baha'i centers, wherever that, they, you know, whatever other religious faith they have, should band together in that organization they have called the interreligious organization and demand a place on the table to drive processes like the uh, uh, implementation of the Integrity Act, implementation of the Procurement Act, and making sure that public service, public institutions, state-owned entity, the government itself, all improve. So in this context, con conflict of interest is a day-to-day -day job. It, 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 be it has to become part of your everyday attitude. Um, but again, the primary role remains with the, the government of the day, but I believe they need help. But they, they should ask for help, especially from the, the religious community. And, and that is what I have to say. Thank you, Says. Nicholas? Well, 
What I would say is that, you know, in when Guyana did not have a market-based economy, unfortunately, you know, certain behavior patterns had to spring up. Now, now that we have a market-based economy, we have to dial that back and bring in back the, the, the rule of law and the ability for procedures to function. So, give you an example. Most people will cite when they interact with some form of government agency, the, the, the normal process that is stated, you know, you follow this, you submit this documentation, you receive this answer within so many days, you then proceed to take this step. That process doesn't function because in the inculcated there is somebody who is expecting some sort of handout. So overall, you know, we have to start to hold, well, first, we have to ensure that the regulators for whatever area of government it is, and there are enough um, regulatory agencies that they have teeth. We need to ensure that the tone at the top from our politicians and the leadership examples it, it's, it says clearly that we intend to follow and abide by the rule of law. We need to ensure that civil society has a very strong voice. You'll have groups like Transparency um, International. You'll have groups like the religious organizations. You'll have the private sector groups. We have to use our voices to say that we want the rule of law and transparency. And then in our own day-to-day -day lives, we must be the shining example. So it's, it, it really requires a holistic solution because as, as Say said, and I agree with it, this is a very endemic problem and it has been around a while. So to solve it, it is going to take all of us, and I, again, the we that I define, working together to solve it. And I think that we need to understand Solving it benefits the entire country, not just a few of us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, Saif Narayan Singh. This has been a very lively discussion today, as it relates to a very active um, issue in Guyana, conflict of interest. Um, we talked a bit today also about the um, no confidence vote and the uh, presentation by the various attorneys. So, uh, with that, I want to. Um, really thank all of our audience who took time off from their Saturday to spend it with us. We really appreciate your time uh, and your interest in uh, looking for better ways um, to make Guyana a, a great country. Um, uh, a housekeeping note from next week, uh, this show would be on Sunday, I believe. Uh, the time and date and everything else would be posted as, um, as indicated. Uh, just keep uh, posted, keep liking the Facebook page and you'll get updates on it. Um, uh, and with that, I want to thank again uh, Globespan 24-7. I would like to thank Nohar Singh and our guests who are here today, uh, including Bishnu Singh, uh, Bishnu uh, uh, Ramnath, uh, for being here today. We really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to uh, bringing to you uh, many more of these lively discussions um, as um, we look for ways to improve Guyana and ourselves. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you.